Thanks for joining me. Uh, when you see the blue wave this large and some people watching, as you know, thinking, gosh, that wasn't what it sounded like we were hearing uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, why is that? It's because, Ari, we have this whole new sensation about what it feels like uh, when the House of Representatives ch uh, changes power. The first time in my lifetime, in my lifetime that that, that, that happened, uh, where, where I watched the House of Representatives change power, uh, was in 1990, the 1994 election. Uh, for 40 years, 40 years before that, <clears throat> the Democrats controlled the House of Representatives, and there was every reason to think they were going to control the House of Representatives forever. Ever since 1994, we've seen the House now go back and forth and, and in relatively short spans of time compared to the older pattern. Mm. And so people have started to get the idea that it is easy to win the House of Representatives. Right. It is the hardest thing you can do in politics by far, especially when uh, the party in power is capable of the kind of gerrymandering we've seen. Right. This is really 21st century gerrymandering. Remember, when they were trying to do, when Democrats were trying to gerrymander the House as they were uh, in areas where they were in control of uh, in the in the 20th century. They didn't have computer modeling. They, did, they didn't have all of the assets and all of the incredible micro data about the individual voters who live in the different neighborhoods as they were carving those things up. So th these are the Republicans. Uh, the 21st century Republicans are the the best gerrymanderers in history, and the Democrats had to run against that and somehow pull out a win. And the other thing we've seen is even where they didn't pull out wins, they made every Republican in the country suddenly feel insecure. If you can't feel secure and safe as a Republican senator in Texas, then you are not safe <laughs> anywhere. You're not supposed to squeak one out in Texas right. if you're if you're the Republican senator. Uh, you're not supposed to, you know, be in any kind of tight race as a Republican running statewide in Georgia. There's not supposed to be any right. tension in any of that. And so uh, these are massive changes. And and, you know, people at Republicans who used to win with uh, 20 point margins are now worried about in their next reelection. Am I going to have a two point margin? Uh, that that's a real life change for and Republicans. So, so you just laid out those fundamentals, including the gerrymandering, the computer modeling, the things that obviously the founders had no idea could right. be abused by politicians so they could pick the voters. Even against that, you get a 40-year record pickup. Then what about the other fundamentals? Because you and I know on these election nights, there's so much swirling around that you're kind of in deep in the weeds. When you pull back on the fundamentals this week, what do you think about the fact that the Democrats delivered this against a reasonably good economy, a reasonably low unemployment rate, and in an environment where in many states there were very credible efforts at Republican voter suppression. Well, that the economy is kind of the, the biggest ignored component of this whole thing. James Carville, who we saw in your clips there, uh, is very famous, created that line now that just lives uh, in an iconic space in politics, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, that was what he had written in the so-called war room of the Clinton campaign in 1992, the winning campaign. Stay on the economy. A presidential campaign is all about the economy. In effect, politics is all about the economy. Mm -hmm. Well, not now, uh, because you couldn't have better economic statistics. So what were those voters voting against? What was it that these voters were rising up against? It wasn't the economy. It was Donald Trump. It was Trump. Trumpism. It was the party that used to call itself the Republican Party that is now the Trump Party. It was a resistance to all of that. Hmm. Uh, before I let you go, Michelle Obama doesn't get political or specific all that often. She does other broader things. Uh, but in her new book, she says directly that Trump's xenophobic uh, birther attacks uh, which you and many others have confronted as racist attacks is something she will simply never forgive him for. And she should never forgive him, and the press should never forgive itself for the way it allowed it to go on. Hmm. The second Donald Trump started talking about Barack Obama's birth certificate on my program, I called him a liar, and I said what he was doing was lying. And that word, that word that I was using, lie and liar, was not acceptable in the American news media. The, the New York Times never said, never said that Donald Trump was hmm. lying about that. And 99% and of the news media never said he was lying about that. And Donald Trump learned the lesson. He could lie, he could get away with it and the news media would not even call it a lie. They were afraid hmm. to call it a lie. And so uh, Barack Obama and his family were left to deal with this. 
uh, versus the crazy Trump machine. And uh, and, and it was the it was the lie that ignited the entire raging madness of Trumpism that we live with now. And I, I blame the news media for mm. failing to confront the foundational lie of Trumpism about that birth certificate. Well, look, you've served in government. Uh, you've embedded into the media, obviously. But I, I think it's useful for us to consider, as we look at these problems, one of the themes across everything we just discussed is what happens if the media gets pulled along or becomes an agent uh, of intolerance or lies, because that is a problem then for civil society. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.